Welcome to First Words, a podcast presented by the First United Methodist Church of Florence. Today's message is brought to you by Senior Pastor Rev. Dale Cohen. I recently ran across a list of important life lessons that children learned through experience, such as, no matter how hard you try, you cannot baptize a cat. Also, when your mom is mad at your dad, don't let her brush your hair. And another, you can't trust your dog to watch your food for you. Don't sneeze when somebody is cutting your hair, and you can't hide your broccoli in a glass of milk. At six years old, one of my sons had his own version of an eye-opening life lesson, and that is never use a magnifying glass to start a fire on a windy February day. We lost our whole yard that day. Well, in today's gospel lesson, John shares about a man who was blind from birth and had an eye-opening experience with Jesus. Jesus heals the man, allowing him to see the world and the faces of the people that he loved for the very first time. The man's transformation is so dramatic that when the townspeople see him, they can't figure out if it's even the same guy or if it's just somebody who kind of looks like him. But the man says, it's me, I'm the one. I was blind, but now I see. Jesus' disciples notice the man as they leave the temple, asking a theological question. Who sinned to cause this man's blindness? Was it the man or was it his parents? The disciples had the common yet mistaken notion that God punished sinners with blindness, lameness, leprosy, and poverty. And therefore, you should keep your distance because you don't want to catch their sin. Jesus saw things differently, saying that neither the man nor his parents were responsible, but rather the man's blindness was an opportunity for God to do something special. So then Jesus spits on the ground and kneels down and he mixes his saliva with the dirt, making a mixture of mud. And then he spread the mud on the man's eyes. And if you read in the Greek New Testament, where it says that he spread that mixture on the man's eyes, it's the exact same word that is used to talk about anointing. And you may remember that Jesus is the Christ. He is the anointed one. And so what Jesus did to the man was he anointed his eyes. They were set apart for something holy. They were set apart to see things that other people may not be able to see. While the man's neighbors were amazed at his healing, the Pharisees were skeptical. Because the miracle occurred on the Sabbath, the Pharisees opened an investigation because they felt that Jesus had violated their religious code. So first they questioned the man, and then they brought in his parents, but neither gave the testimony that the Pharisees wanted. So they brought the man back and began to badger him with questions, trying to get him to give them just the right evidence that they could use to indict Jesus. The man summed up his testimony this way. He said, if this man, if Jesus wasn't from God, he could do nothing. Well, his assertion angered the Pharisees, so they kicked him out. They excommunicated him from the temple. Hearing about this injustice, Jesus went to the man, sought him out, so that he could reveal to him that he was the Son of God. The Scripture says this, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. 
Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard this and said to him, Surely we're not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. His point here is that as long as they think that they can see, that they can fully understand everything there is to understand about God, then they will remain in sin. But it's when they admit that they can't see and that they are open to God continuing to reveal Himself to them that they gain the sight that makes them free of the power of sin. In denying their blindness, the Pharisees unconsciously revealed their unwillingness to see the Son of God standing right before them. They were oblivious to their blindness, and therefore they remained mired in their self-righteousness that clouded their vision, leaving them in spiritual darkness. The man born blind, however, could see so much better than they could. Do you know what having 20-20 vision means? Ophthalmologists measure visual acuity using what's called a Snellen chart. And that's the chart that you're familiar with, the rows of letters in progressively smaller font. And to understand 2020 vision, the first number is the distance in feet that a person stands away from the eye chart. Now, we don't have to do that anymore because the machinery that they use actually adjusts mechanically for that distance. But that first number is at 20 feet, that's where you stand. The second number in 2020 is that that's the line that the normal, the person with normal eyesight can see at 20 feet. And so if then if you have 2040 vision, then at 20 feet you can only see like what the average visioned person sees at 40 feet. Well, Jesus diagnosed the Pharisees probably with, I would say, 2100 or maybe 2200 spiritual vision. But the blind man had 2015 spiritual eyesight because he could see even better than average after Jesus opened his eyes. For you see, when Jesus opens our eyes, we begin to see things in new ways. First of all, we see ourselves more genuinely. There's no telling the damage the blind man's self-image suffered due to how others treated him. The disciples' question about who sinned was rooted in what most people believed. They believed that the blind man was blind because he was evil. And I can't imagine the shame that that assumption placed on him every day of his life and how it beat him down. But some of us carry a distorted view of ourselves largely based on how others see us. However, when Jesus opens our eyes, we begin to see ourselves as God sees us. In 1 John, we read these words, See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. It's as if John knows that he needs to remind us that we are the children of God. We are God's beloved. And no matter what messages we've received, no matter how hard we resist that, This is what we are. We may struggle with that. Did you know are born legally blind? Not that they can't see at all. They they just can't see very well. And when in their mother's arms, a baby can recognize its mother's face, but little else. At six weeks, a baby's vision has developed enough that their eyes, they can control their eye movement and they can make eye contact. 
But it's not until they're three months old that the, the neural connections in their brain have developed enough for the baby to actually see their environment and respond to it. What's so beautiful about this is that the first thing that they're able to see when those connections develop is the smile of their parents. And their response is to smile in return. When Jesus heals our spiritual blindness, we see him smiling at us with that deep love and affection that he has for us. And it makes us smile too. We genuinely begin to see ourselves through his eyes of love. But when Jesus opens our eyes, we also begin to see others more generously. Tim Brewster tells about a mom with her children at a restaurant. Her six-year-old son offered to say grace over the meal, and he prayed, God is great, God is good, let us thank him for our food, but God, I'd be a whole lot more thankful if mom bought us ice cream for dessert. <laughs> Amen. Well, as you did, customers nearby who heard it, they all laughed, but there was one woman seated at the next table who growled, why can't parents teach their kids how to pray a decent prayer anymore? Of all things, asking for ice cream. Well, the boy asked his mom, did I say something wrong? Is God mad at me? And his mom assured him, no, God's not mad at you, son. You did just well. And another elderly man came over to the table and he said, son, I know God really well. And I know that God liked your prayers. As a matter of fact, it may have been the favorite prayer he's heard all day. And then he leaned down and he whispered to the boy as he kind of pointed toward the scowling woman and he said, too bad she's never got asked God for ice cream because ice cream is good for the soul. Well, the family ate their meal, and of course, at the end of the meal, mom ordered ice cream. The little boy stared at his bowl momentarily, but then he picked it up and he went over to the table where that self-righteous woman was seated, and he plopped it down right in front of her, and he said, ice cream is good for the soul. I want you to have this because my soul is good already. And the restaurant broke out in applause, and I can imagine that Jesus also celebrated because this young boy knew about sacrificial love. He gave up his ice cream to show love to someone else. Seeing others is always a matter of the heart not the eyes. In Ephesians, we read, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Most people are trying their best. Even the woman in the restaurant, she was doing the very best that she could. So we need to see everyone as God sees them, imperfect but beloved children, and respond to them as God responds to us, his imperfect but beloved children. The more we accept others with a generous spirit, the more we demonstrate to the world the unconditional love of God. Well, finally, when Jesus opens our eyes, we see God more gracefully. Many people believe in a getcha God, you know, a God who wants to catch us doing something wrong just so he can punish us. Yet this portrayal of God is in sharp contrast to the image of the good shepherd that Jesus gave us when he said this, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. 
That's how much God loves us, that He would die for us. That's love. The Old Testament in the Psalms gives us another picture. The psalmist said, But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. If you're recovering from the image of an angry God, then take these two scriptures that I've just shared with you to heart. But then I've got four steps that I want you to take. And the first is focus on God's love and kindness. Instead of getting all wrapped up in the fear and the punishment, focus on God's loving and kind nature. And if you want proof of that, then just go to the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Read the parables that Jesus told that demonstrate God's love for us. And then the second thing is to practice gratitude. Think of all your blessings and thank God for those blessings. Gratitude helps us see God as a benevolent and generous provider rather than as a punishing deity. And the third thing is that we have to seek forgiveness. We all make mistakes. But here's the difference. When we seek forgiveness from God, we can trust that He wants to forgive us, and so He will do whatever He has to to make us forgivable. We can trust that. And then we begin to work on improving ourselves. And the last thing I want to share with you is to connect with a loving community. Surround yourself with people who celebrate God's graciousness. Worship with those people. Participate in group studies with them. Pray with them. Fellowship with them. And go out into the community and serve alongside them. Because then you will see the love of God in action. But you'll also participate in the love of God and it will transform you with love as well. In the gospel lesson for today, the, the blind man, he was, he was questioned over and over and over again, trying to pin him down as to exactly what happened. And I love how in, in exasperation he says, essentially, look, one thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. We may not fully understand how God is at work in our lives, but it's important that we know that God is at work in our lives, doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves, but also working toward what is in our very best interest. And so when God opens our eyes, we recognize this thing that I hope we all know. We are God's beloved children. And he wants us to see ourselves as that. But he also wants to see others as that. But he also wants us to see him as the kind of God that draws all his beloved children together. And when we see ourselves, others, and the world that way, then we have perfect vision. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen and amen. Thank you for listening to First Words. For more information about our services or how to get involved in our community, visit us at fumcflorence.org or facebook.com slash florencefumc.org.